course, a medal was used for money. It wasn't until Persian times that they actually minted uh, objects specifically for exchange, monetary exchange. They had uh, different artifacts that would be exchanged as having intrinsic value, different types of scarab seals and, and medallions that were minted, commemoratives, that type of thing. But by Persian times, they began to actually mint this specifically to, to transfer wealth. And these early coins were in silver and gold primarily because they had intrinsic value. And the objects would be divided, could be cut up and uh, traded because of the intrinsic value. Money today doesn't have any intrinsic value. It's just paper or it's just, just uh, some kind of zinc alloy with some coating on it. Um, you have to depend upon the trustworthiness of the government that gives out the money. And that used to be quite high. Not sure anymore. Um, my granddad would call a quarter two bits. So a dollar had eight bits. You take a dollar, you could split it into eight parts. Two, two of the eight parts was a quarter. So you can still see if you call a quarter two bits, you still have that remnant of the idea when money could be split. I think in don't the pirates trade in pieces of eight piece of eight, so it's the idea that you have eight pieces together. So oftentimes when archaeologists are digging, they will find coins made out of different types of metals. By the time of the Roman Empire, you're beginning to see semi-precious metals, of uh, bronze and copper and so on. Metal, of course, is used for idols. And uh, in the Bible, you'll see references to household idols. In other words, there were idols that stood in the temples but each house also had its small gods and goddesses. And oftentimes when archaeologists are excavating, they'll find these household idols, which you can see here. One of the more common in Egypt was Apis, the bull god, which you see here. There's also Horus and Anubis, the jackal god, lion gods, cat gods, beaver gods. So just pick an animal <laughs> in Egypt. Chances are it's sacred to some, some god. Even the hedgehog, <laughs> hedgehog god, and people bow down to the mongoose god, and my favorite, the shrew mouse. It's hard for me to imagine worshiping the shrew mouse, but evidently someone did. <laughs> Sacred to Horus. <laughs> of course, the uh, the head god in the pantheon in Canaan and in Mesopotamia was Baal. In fact, Baal was such a, a, an impressive and popular god that the term Baal would be associated with gods. It became a generic. So Baal was a particular god, but a Baal or Baalim could be gods in general. Even husbands could be referred to. Wives had to call their husbands Baal as master or like god of the house and so on. Try to get my wife to do that. <laughs> <laughs> But it did play, you know, the minor prophets talk about that, that whenever they began worshiping other gods, they were adulterers. They went after other husbands, so you can see how they're playing upon that association of Baal and husbands. So this is uh, one of the depictions of the, the god Baal. He's got a sword in one hand and a shield in the other. He was associated with war, with thunder and the sky. He was a sky god and so on. In the ancient world, actually throughout most human history, whenever you have a a god, you have his counterpart, the feminine counterpart, which is a goddess. And so you have a couplet. And Baal's female counterpart was Asherah. This is a mold. It's a limestone mold that was uncovered. And then they've made a bronze casting from it so you can actually see what the idol would have looked like. But this is the actual artifact, the mold. Some kind of shrine that was making these um, Asherah idols. And so it was very common to have male-female counterparts. And 